All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my live stream. <laughs> Some of you might be aware <laughs> that uh, yesterday I unleashed my most nuclear tweet ever to this day, and <laughs> I've had some nuclear tweets. So maybe there'll be some time to discuss that. Uh, but the main focus of today's live stream is I will be joined by Nina Power and DC Miller. They've been on the show before, and so many of you will remember them from last time. Okay, I see them here now. They're hanging out in the background. They're they're in the green room. Okay, very very posh. You know, uh, very expensive, impressive uh, production apparatus I have here. They're in the green room. They're being fed, you know, peanuts and caviar and champagne. I'll bring them in in just a minute. I prep them that I have to do a little uh, introduction and housekeeping. So I'm looking forward to talking about that, talking with them about their legal campaign that they're mounting against Luke Turner. Uh, they have to tread lightly for obvious legal reasons. So that's fine that we probably won't talk too much about the details of the case, but uh, we will. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And what we really want to talk about is we had a little private chat the other week, and we had some really interesting discussions about, well, the nature of toxicity and how people think about this idea of toxicity, like toxic masculinity or what have you. It's really quite a superstitious and quite interesting mental model that people have in their minds when when they when they use these types of terms. So. We want to break that down, and we have some other interesting tangents that are somewhat related that we were also kind of brainstorming. So I think this is going to be quite an interesting and philosophically rich conversation based on the informal chat we had last week. I'm really looking forward to this. So that'll be the plan for today. And uh, before I bring them in, just a few things for people. Uh, I just want to kind of update people on my projects. First of all, someone, Josh, in the chat says, referring to my tweet of yesterday, he says, a take so volcanic, it destroyed Justin's public reputation. Bitch, you think I care about my public reputation? Or rather, do you really think that the thousands of normal bourgeois losers who saw my tweet and got their panties in a twist, do you really think that those people are the determination of my public reputation? Those people are going to forget about this in a few days. And guess what? From the controversy that was kicked up yesterday by my tweet, a whole bunch of new people have come to me who are actually really interested in what I'm doing and they understand the larger long-term uh, project. So what you have to understand about these Twitter controversies is you can't be afraid of this backlash. It can hurt and it can, you know, everything makes you feel in your brain like, oh, this is really bad when you have thousands of people basically telling you you're a pedophile or telling you that you should be killed or um, these sorts of things. It definitely has a psychological effect on you, but you have to just have confidence in the larger model of what's really going on in the world today and 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 creating your own systems to hack it because frankly i mean these people can do nothing to me what was interesting is that one of the common motifs in people's attacks on me since yesterday it a lot of those people they think they're canceling me like they say explicitly haha this guy's gonna lose his job now haha hey everyone pile on this guy let's get him fired this guy shouldn't be a professor like that's what a lot of these people are saying Meanwhile, <laughs> little do they know, I'm five steps ahead of them because I'm essentially cancel proof now. I've already completely kind of um, left any vulnerability that I had by dependence on institutions. So now all these people are really doing is drawing attention to me and the small number of actual radical thinkers who are interested in dangerous ideas and kind of fearless public thinking and discussion. Those people now know me. Uh, probably at least a hundred more from yesterday than there was from the day before. And all the haters are going to disappear and forget in two days. But all the people that are really like trying to do something serious and interesting with the internet and creative, intellectual, kind of radical political life, all those people are going to stay because now they know that, you know, they know what I'm doing. So you have to understand these things and you have to have confidence in this longer, this longer term type of calculation and not get scared by these these all these stupid normal bourgeois haters they're they're you know if you if you create your systems in a way that you're not there's nothing really that they can take away from you um then in fact you're kind of using their stupidity to basically um uh, have larger public impact you just have to have the courage and conviction of of what you actually think so okay so so no i'm no yesterday was not a problem at all it, it was exactly according to plan i would say so all right um, I don't want to. I don't want to riff too much about that. We can return to it if people want to. 
But uh, if you have any questions for Nina or DC at any time, pl please uh, enter them in the public chat here. I'll be monitoring it. We don't have my intern, Ben, here with us today, so I'll be multitasking, but that's fine. And um, yeah, what else? The only other thing I wanted to say is actually from yesterday, so many people were um, being drawn to my projects from, from that controversy that on, the, on a whim, what I did, I, this was literally, I just thought of it in the middle of this uh, blow up yesterday. Um, because so many people misunderstand the nature of how to be a radical public intellectual today, that these systems and these patterns of the herd, like herd behavior is so stupid and predictable that you really can plan around it and you really can use it to your advantage if you want to create a kind of a powerful intellectual public project that um, I decided I would make a, a little free online course. Essentially, just I'm just going to tell you everything I've learned and all of the kind of insights and tips and tricks that I've learned over the past year or two. Um, about how public digital culture really works and how to think about it if you want to if you want to really be you know constitute a kind of long-term public intellectual project that's cancel proof but is not only able to say the most dangerous provocative things but when you say dangerous provocative things you can actually exponentially kind of grow your following and and public influence i figured out a lot about that so i'm going to do a, a little free it's totally free just a little thing to because apparently people need this people really want to learn this kind of stuff so i'm so i put a link in the description below uh if you want if you want if you're interested in learning that kind of thing there's a link it's totally free it'll just be a series of emails where i'll, where I'll just kind of teach you my model of how this works and why it's actually a really good thing if you want to be an intellectual. Okay, so enough about my stuff. I'll leave it at that. As always, um, I have a private Discord server, which you're welcome to join. That is, uh, there's also a link to that in the description below. Otherwise, yeah, obviously subscribe if you haven't done so already, you know, leave a comment, whatever. But uh, otherwise, let's just get right to it, I think. So I am now going to welcome, oh, by the way, real quick, sorry, hang tight, Nina and DC. You might notice that this is a new microphone. It's a nicer microphone. And I'm hoping, I'll have to listen back to it after, but I'm hoping that my audio sounds much better. Uh, let me know in the chat, but my voice should be a little bit you know, smoother and, and nicer to listen to. Uh, and this was got with the support of my patrons. I did a little campaign recently uh, because I, precisely because I was, I needed to buy kind of newer, better audio technology to kind of up my game. And a lot of people came through, a, a lot of new patrons came through and a lot of old patrons kind of up their pledge. So um, I'm now starting to uh, reap the, reap the, ben the benefits of your uh, contribution. So I just wanted to kind of flag that and big thanks to everyone who's helping me kind of build this up. Hopefully this is a, a nice first step, this microphone. All right, folks, here we, here we go. Daniel and Nina, get ready. I'm bringing you in. All right, there they are. Can you see me? Okay. You need to yeah. Get, you need to get yeah. You guys, you guys should squeeze together a little bit, or like push the camera go back. go backwards. Yeah, no, push the camera can't. backwards a bit. Um. Like can you do a little better than that? Hang on. I here's what I can do. I can um. Do it one at a time. Do it so you can see yourself. Yeah. Try. There we go. Okay. I'll, we'll do that. I think that gives you. Yeah. Okay. This is better. It gives you more space. There you go. Mm -hmm. All right, All right, Nina, DC. Thanks for coming on. Nice to see you, Justin. Nice to see you both. The end of police protection. Nice to see you both. Yes, thank thank you for coming on. I'm really excited about this conversation. We had a really nice little informal discussion last week, so I think I think we have quite an interesting agenda. I think for, for to, just to kick things off, I want to let people know about the legal campaign you're doing. I understand that mm -hmm. Nina and DC, you guys can't really talk too much about it for legal reasons, which make perfect sense. Mm -hmm. But um, the least I can do is, you know, I'm not involved in the case, so I can talk a little bit about it. And you can correct me if I'm wrong on anything, but I, I won't say too much. I just want to let people know that Nina and DC are fundraising right now to build a legal campaign against Luke Turner. If you don't know, Luke Turner is basically one of the most notorious, rabid, kind of uh, nasty, resentful um, attackers of anyone thinking or speaking anything at all interesting in public. He basically accuses people of being fascists or Nazis. And uh, yeah, and to, to, to a pretty uh, kind of stunning and I think quite disgusting degree. And I think, you know, Nina and DC, uh, they can speak for themselves, but they uh, are mounting a legal campaign because they believe that Luke Turner's behavior is essentially um, he's lying about people and, he, and he's doing really direct damage to uh, people's livelihoods. And, you know, I'm very interested in uh, legal campaigns or legal strategies. Uh, I It's not my cup of tea personally. Like, I just don't want to get involved in uh, like courtrooms and shit like that. But um, I'm definitely intrigued by this 
angle of kind of cultural strategy. So, um, you know, I know Nina in DC and uh, I, I don't know Luke Turner personally, but I definitely have an understanding of his kind of presence in the public culture. So I personally am quite uh, interested in their legal campaign and I'm, I'm interested to see the results and I'm definitely willing to put my weight behind it. I think, I think it's an interesting and worthwhile uh, effort. So um, if you want to help them do that, there's a link in the description below. They still do need a, a few thousand dollars more. Um, and there's about a week left, a little bit more than a week left. I think they're going to make it, but they they do need help. So um, if yeah, if you're really interested in and really concerned about these types of issues, and you want to support a, a legal strategy to start pushing back against these these kind of uh, censors that have appointed themselves censors in the public culture, then uh, I think this is a really good opportunity. So I just wanted to kind of lay that out at the beginning. I don't think we're actually going to talk too much about this. Uh, I but I did just want to kind of tell you all about it and encourage you to support them if you want to. Um, did you guys, Nina and DC, did you want to add anything to that or do you want to just um, leave it at that and, and move on to the more interesting substantive discussions? Well, I think the general questions which are posed in a way by uh, what happens on social media, also what happens when uh, people are very dedicated to, to saying things that aren't true and repeating things that aren't true and how these kinds of mediums facilitate that kind of mode of activity and then what can you do about it? I think that for us, uh, it seems like there's a way in which, well, it's more than just only uh, sort of a few mean things. It's quite a sustained campaign. And yeah, it's, it's, it's not really possible to say too much about it specifically. But I think that what you've been facing in the last few days is sort of an aspect of the same kind of phenomenon because it's about how what René Girard called mimetic spirals kind of get going and why they do and what it means to be, in a way, a scapegoat by, um, by people who are, in a sense, projecting their own, uh, their own insecurities onto you and, and why they would do it and why other people would go along with that. Right. Right, absolutely. Nina, did you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I suppose um, I'm interested in questions of <laughs> truth and uh, justice and whether these things, um, you know, have a reality uh, today in a certain sense um, and what it might mean to kind of be able to speak freely, to think freely, for people to think for themselves uh, and so on. And, you know, I suppose I'm, I'm very... Um, you know, we've seen a lot of attempts to kind of uh, no platform and cancel, you know, various people uh, for various things, often preemptively. And, you know, I suppose I'm much more interested in a kind of dynamic, open culture in which we talk to each other about difficult things, about the very complex uh, ways of being about complex questions that we have to do with, you know, being human, to do with desire uh, and all of these things. So um, in that sense, um, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Cool. cool. Great. Yeah. I, I think we're, we have plenty of time to talk about all of these things. So thanks for throwing those things on the table. If you don't mind, I'd be curious to start by just asking, how are you two doing personally, emotionally? Uh, because, you, you know, in your own ways, you, you both are, you both have your own kind of long-term struggles with, with public opinion and, and these types of perverse social phenomena going on. How are, how are you both feeling at the moment? I'm just curious. I feel fine. I don't take it too seriously, to be honest. I think that once you've heard the same thing said by thousands of different people, then you start to understand that it's not really personal. And mm -hmm. that's a really good point. Go yeah. Ahead. Go ahead. So, um, you know, there's a structural mechanism actually, which involves uh, a certain kind of relationship to symbols and a certain kind of individual psychology. And I think what happened with you was quite interesting because what you somehow did was you sort of triggered this mechanism and, and the way in which you did that is actually interesting to consider. Hmm. What you can see from it, if you try to reflect on it in a more general sense, is that quite obviously many people's thinking is being guided by these taboos which are operating in their in their in their relationship to the environment, which makes it very, very difficult for them to be able to reflect, for example, on the kind of uh, syllogism that you produced. You know, you said basically, if A, then B, right? And mm -hmm. B 
because people for various reasons weren't even able to consider whether A was was or was not, they immediately went to, oh, how can you say B, you know? Right. And you're having this kind of relationship now that uses it having towards social media where it's almost just like a direct sort of feedback loop whereby it enters into the optic nerve and is immediately typed out before it passes a, a conscious reflection process, right? And the quantity in which people kind of form groups of, of, of you know, individuals basically repeating the same thing, just they're all repeating the same thing. It's like quite an interesting phenomenon, really, because mm -hmm. you can say that, you know, whatever else is going on, there's something which is not individual about this process, but something quite structural and systematic. Absolutely. That's a really, really good point. One of the things I find most interesting and revealing about when these things happen to oneself is that there are a few common themes that pretty much every hateful comment takes up one of these few common themes. There are like templates, in other words, there are kind of cultural mm -hmm. templates. And when you, you know, when you are subject to this kind of mob hatred in a sudden acute moment, if you don't, if you're able to not take it personally, it's actually a really, really powerful learning experience for what is really going on in the in the culture at large. And you're absolutely right. I think your diagnosis of the, kind of the psychology is vindicated by by what we know empirically about how the brain works. So, so psychologists distinguish between what we call system one and system two. System one is always happening in the background. It's cheap, quick, easy for the brain to do. Um, and it's basically the opposite of of philosophical reflection. It's just immediate, instinctual, intuitive uh, processing of what's good and bad, where our minds are constantly doing this. And so um, the tweets that I have uh, produced like really nuclear uh, controversies over, ha all, they all have a very similar formula. And they're essentially, as you said, DC, it's like, um, it's, a sen it's not an opinion. It's not even really a statement. It's an if then, it's an if then statement that pretty much it makes people feel disgusted. It's a feeling. It's it's technically a kind of intuitive emotional response. Like this is bad to say. It's not. That's system one. Uh, system two is like cash, is 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 rational reflection where you you sit back, you kind of think about it, you you pick it up from different angles, and you kind of reflect on it. Obviously, system two is. Uh, the domain of serious adult philosophical reflection of any kind. System one is just normal people's monkey brains firing rapidly. And all the research shows that essentially what you're saying, DC, is absolutely correct in a very technical sense. The overwhelming majority, well, probably every single person who joins this kind of hate mob against like a provocative thinker is pure system one. Like they're just not even entering into system two. And so the other thing that I find very interesting that I would just add to what you, to your very, very good diagnosis, DC, is that um, one thing you learn is that is the power of these like random blue check mark journalists. I think that's what's kind of interesting. The reason why this last tweet from yesterday went so nuclear is pretty much as far as I can tell, because two um, well-known kind of lefty journalist figures with blue check marks basically pounced. And, and it was only when these people pounced that huge mobs started attacking me on like every possible platform. And I think that's revealing too, because if you think about it, all of these people, they're really following like the cheapest cues or orders of kind of people who they see as powerful people or people that they see as opinion leaders. And in fact, this kind of brings us to the, to the question of Luke Turner, because if you have power in society and you're respected or you have like institutional affiliations that people assign social status to, if you say DC Miller is evil or DC Miller is a fascist, everyone else who is so kind of um, zombie like in their in their following of that order that that these people such as Luke Turner or like in my case, it was Brianna Wu and uh, Jamel Bowie, like these blue checkmark people actually do have extraordinary power to basically just name someone as toxic, right? And then huge swaths of people will just follow the order. And what I find interesting about that is that it really shows how stupid and 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 kind of uh, embarrassingly lame these, these people are, right? Like it almost proves that all of these people coming to attack you are the most brain dead, zombie-like bourgeois normies out there that they're just following these orders at the drop of a dime. It's pathetic. It's so pathetic that it actually, when you go through it and you're able to reflect on it in this way, 
you actually start to see through it in a very powerful and empowering way because you're like, oh, all of these people hating me are 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 meaningless. Like, like they're they're absolute losers essentially. And when you see it like that, I think we start to get traction on what's really going on. And then we can learn how to as like if you want to be a serious philosopher or intellectual of any kind, we just have to kind of understand how these things work and then create our own like update and advance our own practices to 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 be smarter than that and to and to rise above it and and, and figure out how to do it. That's that's what I'm thinking anyway. But I'm ranting now. What do you guys think? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a kind of ordeal. I mean, it's a kind of, it, like you say, at a certain level, a very interesting experience to go through to be kind of attacked, um, to be quote unquote cancelled or attempted to be cancelled. You know, I mean, I, I myself left my academic job recently. You know, I didn't lose my job. I left it. And uh, I mean, partly because of this feeling of, of really having nothing to lose. Like if I've got nothing to lose, then I, you know, people can't take it away from me, you know, and then oh, yeah. the you know, there's something like vertiginous about this, actually, you know, and I have somewhere to live. I'm fortunate in this regard, you know, and I, I do my best to be to be kind and to share what I have, you know, but I, in a sense, I would rather live in a free way, you know, even if it's a bit more like being Diogenes or whatever, you know, a personal hero of mine. And yeah, and, and, you know, to be able to think freely, but I mean, also, this is a kind of maybe be a you know almost like a you know quasi spiritual uh experience in fact you know to to go through this kind of public shaming and this kind of thing and and you know it's like a i don't know it it, it does kind of open your mind up right you you feel free to think again somehow and our friend john t compares it to a kind of angelic state like you you pass through this kind of ordeal and this trial you know, and I think there's something to that, but it, it feels very real. And, you know, I'm very, I'm a huge fan of R.D. Lang, you know, and R.D. Lang talks about the politics of experience and that, you know, what it means to, in a sense, feel alive. And I feel alive for other reasons I've discussed with you in relation to overcoming addiction with the help of my dear friend here, Daniel, you know. And, and so, that, yeah, I think there is this kind of like uh, extraordinary uh, experience of reality, basically you know, which for the first time in a long time, I, I feel, you know, going through these various crises. So that's the emotional answer that you were asking about. There's, um, there's a great, there's a great model in, in Naked Lunch by William Burroughs, where he describes the, the, the different political parties of interzone. And you have the, the liquefactionists, the divisionists, the senders, and then there's a fourth party called the factualists, which I'll mention in a moment. But basically, all of these different parties are, in a sense, kind of, defined by their relationship to communication. And the senders are, in a sense, it seems to me, the sort of party which is quite dominant today. And it works by a certain, even Burroughs describes it, a telepathic broadcast. And so, as you say, people somehow like receive a certain kind of signal and that signal actions them. Uh, it's not an order, I don't think, but rather it's a kind of way in which you sort of define somebody as a legitimate target. And I think what's really going on there is that basically people have a lot of very violent impulses and they're looking for ways in which they can discharge these feelings. And the feelings that are generated by the frustrations of everyday life to some extent. And they're looking for ways of, of, of you know, ridding themselves of these frustrations that they feel. And so what happens is, is the verified users kind of say, you know, this guy, like, you know, you can direct your your hatred and your rage and your anger against against this person, and you can even feel good about doing that because this person is is a is a person that's basically um, has acquired a kind of sacred status to be the sort of receptacle of this kind of you know negative negative feeling. And so, obviously, in producing a certain kind of container, which is uh, not a moral position, but rather is actually just kind of a mirror. You function for those people as a kind of thing that can be legitimately, you know, attacked. Basically, obviously, you know, you've been around a few times, so you know what's going on. But you know, many people don't actually, and it is, um, you know, for certain people who sort of get into the crosshairs of these kinds of things, like quite a um, devastating experience suddenly to have this sort of situation where it seems like the whole world you know, is shouting at them for reasons they don't even understand, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what we're facing now across many different sectors and 
in a way, the definition of these sectors is not insignificant because it's also to do with how, for example, frustrations are created in environments in which there are more persons seeking positions than there are positions available, which is true of almost every cultural sphere. Uh, what you're getting is a kind of uh, very cynical uh, strategy whereby these kinds of negative affects are kind of being directed against individuals by other individuals who are using that mechanism in order to achieve a certain amount of power for themselves. Because there is a power that you can gain from being a witch hunter, basically. And what is going on here is a kind of a sort of distributed, networked witch hunt. It's sort of rolling onwards, always and forever, is because when you target the witch, they become the fuel for the machine, which then grows larger, essentially, which is why you burn the witch, because they're producing. So mm. um, I think what we're sort of dealing with on the internet in a kind of way, it's a certain kind of virtual witch hunt, whereby somehow like the, the blue checks, who obviously are not reflective people insofar as they're participating in these kinds of activities, you know, they need to keep sacrificing people so they can be the sort of sacrificer in chief. And this is their religious role of things, actually. Right. That's a really OK. That's a really good point. And what's also interesting to think about is there's this other source of positive feedback for this accelerating insane process of, of kind of escalating witch hunting, which is that precisely because of this escalating witch hunt culture, all those blue checks and kind of normal journalists or whatever they're less and less free to say anything interesting. So it mm. makes them more and more dependent on finding someone who did something evil because increasingly that's all they're allowed to write about. Mm. Yeah, totally. And then, I mean, this spiral model is completely right, it seems to me. And I mean, yeah, I mean, we can read Rene Girard. I mean, he explains this. I mean, we do have a problem when you don't have a culture that has a mechanism anymore, really, for coping with, you know, these sort of um, violent feelings, you know, like there is no sacrifice. So people start to become the, the scapegoat, you know, because there is still the need for that. And I think in the virtual world, people don't think it's real in a certain way. You know, you can throw names around, you see names, you know, you don't necessarily think there's a real person behind the name. And, you know, and, and, and it's this kind of thing. So there's a kind of virtual playground. And we must remember that like Peter Thiel, you know, is a Girardian, right? He knows this stuff, right? A lot of the people in Silicon Valley know about these kind of uh, things. They don't allow their children to use social media, for example, you know, there is a, a sense in which some people know what's going on, you know, right. and, and other people are kind of, you know, being manipulated. I mean, we've been manipulated all the time, but you know, there, there's this. And I mean, I suppose one thing I was trying to say on our last uh, live stream was about, you know, nature and going outside. And, you know, this is a very, in a way, I mean, it came across as a, a very um, uh, a thing to attack me for in a certain way, because you're saying to people online, go outside, simply. It sounds quite uh, terrible. And, and therefore, you know, you're a, you're a Nazi because you say you like the sun and, and all of this, you know. And But I think it's, um, I don't know, to think about escape, to think about exit, you know, to, to remember that this isn't everything. You know, I, I've been spending a lot of time just speaking to people one on one in a non recorded way, mm. you know, just having conversations with random people. I'm running this like friendship thing and it's and it's so nice. And it, it's just this incredibly simple thing just to speak to somebody. And of course, it's completely different. And we used to, you know, I mean, I was 18 before I used the Internet and I remember this time, you know, <laughs> And there was a lot of boredom in this very beautiful way. In fact, you could read a book and feel bored and speak to someone. And the difference between a conversation one on one, you know, and the Internet is just vast. And, you know, our brains are being rewired in this terrible way. What can you say? Yeah, yeah. You gave me a really interesting idea, which is what if I volunteered myself to be an actual human sacrifice for people like Brianna Wu and Jamel Bowie? <laughs> Like have done. To, to, to basically end to end this escalating witch crap, this witch hunt yeah. kind of phenomenon that our society is trapped into. What if I said, look, in the interest of society and its future, Brianna Wu, I invite you to kill me. You can do it in public. We'll st we'll stage a big event. I will consent to you shooting me in the head in order to I will fully assume absolute responsibility for all of the horrible things that have ever happened and society will feel so much better. It'll be so exciting and it'll bring everyone together. They'll feel so bonded and, and excited by this extraordinary act of, of human sacrifice of the scapegoat. I think you're, cause I think you're right. Like we're all, people are so hungry and they're in such need for 
actual outlets of aggression and they're, they're so starved for actual, um, you know, uh, re redress of grievances that people really do need. It is possible that the only way to kind of solve this problem is, is to find some kind of way for everyone to get the kind of bloodlust that they that they desire and need so bad in a way that kind of minimizes the damage. OK, I have a plan. I mean, so next summer, I want there to be the third summer of love because it's about time. Right. In Britain, we had the second summer of love in the 90s and there was one before that in the 60s. You know, and I think there's a way in which there's a kind of collective. And the, this is what Mark Fisher was talking about, you know, before his untimely death. And, and you know, this idea that actually perhaps I mean, the sacrifice, though, I have to say, we, we, we joked about you being sacrificed on the last, li last live stream and I got accused of defending human sacrifice, you know, and but, but here we're talking about it again. And I, I think it can't be with a gun. I think it needs to be much more ritual, you know, in the middle of the night or something. A sword. Like that. Yeah. yeah, whatever. And, but you know, but I mean, we're joking, but at the same time, not. And I think you, in a way, you already have performed the function of a scapegoat, Thank to you. be honest. I'm Thank wondering... You. What the relationship between you know that kind of ritual the sacrifice and let's say the celebration you know because the other thing we've we, we don't have enough of really is a collective celebration i mean it used to be that like drugs and drink for example were were meted out at specific times you know at the end of the harvest you would have a kind of collective festival you would mark the changing of the seasons you know and all of these sorts of things and there's a way in which that kind of uh violence but also joy and euphoria and collective being and sexual feeling and and desire for inebriation was channeled into ritual you know and somehow these things have become completely dissipated atomized you know they're very painful people are self-medicating constantly you know the, those those substances themselves you know can still be used in an you know uh, an elevating way a euphoric way but rarely you know they're often individualized atomized and so i think you know when we're talking about sacrifice we're also talking about celebration and a kind of dionysiac um desire that people also have and how do we bring people together in like in in a sort of i don't know explosion of love as well as you know a recognition of you know more brutal forces no that's beautiful and that's a really good point because in the current way that people are getting their sacrificial needs they're not actually getting that final release they don't get that celebration it's just yeah. perpetual attempts to kill the scapegoat multiple times a day every day on twitter but they never actually get that sweet release that their kind of evolved desire is really seeking and i think that's another reason for the the kind of escalating nature of this process there, there's no satisfaction i mean there are a couple of things to consider here i mean one is that according to the gerard's model it's important that the scapegoat is actually innocent it's the substitution so what you do with the scapegoat is you take somebody who is essentially on the fringes of society, so therefore can serve as the medium for these violent sort of feelings to be poured into that won't then trigger reciprocal violence. Because the alternative mm. to the to the sacrificial victim is is a kind of civil war, basically, in which people are fighting each other all the time. Um, so, from that point of view. Um, you could only work as a scapegoat insofar as you are specifically not guilty. And what we've got now is a situation where actually that's not really clear. I mean, it's clear to me, but it's not clear to, you know, the sort of the blue checker basically, because all of these people somehow are seized with the thought that you are actually somehow guilty of these things that they've, they've accused you of. And so therefore mm. you can't really be a scapegoat actually. So you're a dysfunctional scapegoat. And this is basically what we have. We have dysfunctional sacrifice mm. rituals. It's the same with the um, you know role played to some extent by by Trump actually you know where he became this sort of um, embodiment of all the sort of frustrations to do with all the different things about the American political system, and also anti-fascism because they have this kind of ritual that they sort of devise where they need to sort of punch they need to punch Nazis. But the problem is that that is not a functional ritual in terms of dissipating violence it actually just encourages violence because it adds to a reciprocal cycle of mimetic violence so mm. i don't know what we can do exactly but it's something to do with you know even like the structure of the global economy is such that you know within almost every single sector there are these frustrations and tensions that have been building and building and building and they have no obvious outlet whatsoever 
Yeah, I mean, I think this is why the apology doesn't work, for example, like if someone has transgressed or been accused of a transgression and then they say sorry, in a way it kind of adds fuel, you know, because actually that's not what people want. They want further sacrifice. They want to, you know, the bloodlust is still there. So the, the apology actually reminds them of the, the humanness of the person, which is exactly what they don't want at that moment. <laughs> mm. So, I mean, there's a kind of question about, um, yeah, about all of our humanness, actually, in a certain way, like... Uh, I don't know how do we hang on to it i mean i'm very interested at the moment i'm thinking a lot about character and personality and how you know these sorts of things now seem strangely outdated you know like people have identities and you know and what what we used to like about each other perhaps was um a certain uh you know singularity you know a certain specificity of the person like we like a gesture or a something maybe they don't even notice about themselves you know like a you know like a, mm, I don't know, or what they've read or what they learned or what they're interested in, or all of these things. And they're a mess. I mean, everybody is a sort of incoherent mess in some ways, a product of circumstance and, and so on. And, you know, and, and now I think there's a too quick move to say, well, I am X, you know, and, and you should like me or be interested in me because I am X. But actually, nobody is anything in a certain way. I mean, this is a very existentialist point, but like, you're not really anybody or anything in, until you sort of fill yourself with things in a certain way. And, um, yeah, I don't know. So that, that that kind of question of the uh, of the the existential or the human uh, somehow, I don't know how to bring it back. Like, how do we maybe recombine that with this kind of di also maybe need for the ritual or the sacrifice? You know, to also remember that people are people somehow, but whatever that means. I don't know. I, I think that if I could just pick yes. it up from there, but like <laughs> the, the, the the question of of hate and the rhetoric of hate and also the projection of hate onto onto the other. Now, hate is something that in a way more or less like all human beings feel in some way or another because we are you know as you know as a catholic justin you know we, we're fallen beings right but this doctrine of hatred this sort of fluid hatred which has to be fought there's like a kind of hate speech like this is the symptom of the breakdown of the sacrificial mechanism because people can sense this kind of fluid violence which is sort of moving around like nobody is willing to in a sense understand that also you know that's something that's coming from from us as individuals you know and nobody is willing to take responsibility in that way for their own um you know sad passions mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so like this kind of uh projection projection mechanism mm -hmm. right which is always moving things towards the other and then directing it at them according to uh, logic of yeah what the last psychiatrist called projection which is essentially when you feel something and you don't want to admit that it's coming from you. And so you think that it's mm -hmm. a product of somebody else. No, and I mean, this mm. very, like, if I was thinking about the graphic image of smearing, it's like, you know, you take all this horrible stuff from your own insides and you put it on someone else and then you point at them and say, like, they're toxic, you know, don't go near them. You know, it's like to smear someone is sort of like literally to cover them in, like, you know, manure and feces and all of these, like, horrible things and then be like, you know they're untouchable you know you can't it, there's something like this you know um and it's very like visceral and and uh yeah i mean like i've been to things where people like move away from me as if i am like some contaminant which is kind of interesting i think you're both really helping to highlight an important feature of all of this that a lot of people don't understand because it this is a thing that you you only really understand if you are subject to this type of phenomenon and if you've never been subject to it there are certain things that are really hard to communicate to you because for instance the 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 real truly violent nature of these mobs is easily underestimated what i'm getting at here is like before i became subject to these mobs i i knew they existed i knew they were nasty i knew it was, it was a major kind of cultural problem or issue but what you don't understand until it happens is these are often normal, like middle-aged people with jobs, even respectable jobs, who, because some blue check mark says someone is bad, these people, normal, functioning, seemingly healthy and successful even people, will go to like your Facebook page and say, I hope that you die, or I, I would kill you if I had a chance. 
these are not weird freaks with anonymous avatars. These are, these are actually normal people. That's what I find very surprising and quite intriguing that a lot of people don't understand. Like when we think about the violence and the death threats, most people have in their mind, oh, that's probably, you know, it's, it's egghead pictures on Twitter or like, you know, people living in their basements, uh, really, really kind of sad, small minority of the population would ever like send a death threat or a, uh, you know, a violent, message like that to someone in their Twitter DMs or or on their Facebook page. But but that's what's underestimated. Actually it's it's a large number of very normal people. <laughs> and that's that's kind of scary. Like um people I I think that's that's really worth thinking about. Yeah, I mean I think this is question of the shadow and like are you willing to confront your own shadow? I mean, you know, I was speaking this morning with a very interesting woman about you know, fascism is not necessarily over there. It's like potentially kind of everywhere, you know, it's and 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 in a sense, I'm very interested in like, you know, recognizing and de-escalating those things. I mean, I'm very curious at the moment about about humor, like we you know, like the role of humor in a sense, laughing at oneself, also laughing at everyone, potentially, you know, that these are kind of like mechanisms. Of course, laughter can be cruel, humor can be cruel as well, but like how do we kind of de-escalate and, and avoid these kinds of like, um, I don't know, groupings, these kind of mobbings, you know, are there kind of techniques? I mean, clearly human beings have learned techniques to avoid violence. Otherwise we'd be at war, we'd be in the Hobbesian state of nature, you know, which is equality in a certain sense, as Hobbes says, you know, everyone is, is equally free to defend themselves wherever they choose, you know, and, and we live in a society, you know, I mean, there is <laughs> various <laughs> ways in which that's true, but, you know, I, I suppose- <laughs> Go on. No, I mean, just so I, I don't know. I mean, like maybe the old mechanisms or the more recent mechanisms, like maybe we need newer ones. I, I don't know. I mean, it seems like people have lost their sense of humor. Maybe. I don't know. Well, if I could just again pick up on that. I mean, the, the essence of the sacrifice mechanism is that there's a distinction between legitimate and illegitimate forms of violence. And so the point is these people are coming to you and they're speaking under their own name because it's legitimate to be violent towards you because a blue check not has told them that it's okay, right? So that's the point. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, why is it legitimate? Well, because you've somehow transgressed some sort of, uh, you know, spontaneous theology of taboo that you didn't necessarily know existed, or maybe you did. I mean, I think that one of the ways in which your tweet was so provocative was that it was somehow combining, on the one hand, this sort of high sacred uh, Greta Thunberg personage, who has been in a sense sort of um, herself licensed to sort of speak as a kind of uh, tribune of the world. And on the other hand, this sort of, you know, like low, low sacred as in criminal, um, you know, things connected to to Jeffrey Epstein, who's been obviously, you know, configured into a certain kind of like demonic monster, right? And so you say, well, what's the difference between these things actually, right? And people go mad because that is a economy which is functioning not on the level of rational thought, but on the level of a certain kind of sacred uh, structure. And legitimate victims of the sacrifice mechanism are being decided on the basis of whether they conform to this structure or not. Now, what you then have to ask yourself is how legitimate is this is this structure itself, right? I mean, you point out that there's a hypocrisy in it, right? And there's obviously a hypocrisy in it. And it's obviously also the case on some level that all of these people that were sort of claiming to be demonic in a certain way are functioning as scapegoats themselves for something which is actually more widespread you know, and something that other people are also engaged in in ways which are maybe not so, you know, flamboyant, but are actually much more normalized and depressingly normalized. If you think about how much pornography is consumed on the internet, you know, I have a theory, Justin, actually, <laughs> that basically what the internet is, is really just like a gigantic brothel. And everything that's written on the internet is like people just sort of writing messages on the walls as they wait to see the prostitute. And the real thing that's gone wrong is that this kind of text and speech has somehow become instrumental in the rest of society that apparently responsible people who should be running you know, institutions in a responsible way are responding to things as if written on men, men's room walls, you know? Like I saw this thing written on a men's room wall about you and so therefore I have to cancel, you know? Right. And that's what's going on. That's really yeah, fascinating. I think, yeah, go ahead. I think this kind of question of like recording, you know, everything is recorded. Everyone, you can find anything in anyone's life that they've said or done 
you know, and you can either it's like there and electronically, or you can write it up in such a way that it makes it sound like the worst thing ever, and that this person is somehow uniquely uh, demonic and and worthy of punishment more than anyone else is, you know. And like, of course, everyone has done good and bad things, right? I mean, every single person and has had good and bad thoughts and and so on. Like we know this, but nevertheless, you know, this kind of utter total recording of everything means that basically people you can't forget. You know, so even if you forget that someone said some, you know, an off color tweet like, you know, 10 years ago, someone will remind, bring it back. Oh, look, here it is again and again. And and so, like, we have this kind of complete, like, I don't know, total Parmenidean block of like everything that's ever happened is sort of like there all the time. And like it's a sort of stasis, which is another word for civil war, of course. And then, you know, what do we do? We can't move. Like everyone's like, eh. But everyone's also like incredibly afraid because you know like institutions are afraid it's not that institutions cancel people because they agree with any of the sentiment on the brothel wall is that they're afraid of their own reputations being tarnished and that they themselves will also tumble and suffer so it's nothing to do with often with the content or hardly ever with the content of any claim but really rather this fear of controversy the fear of being tainted or like you know this toxicity spreading you know everywhere that's really well put. I think that's that's very true. And I think one of the underlying mechanisms is the need for attention. I mean, attention is basically one of the most valuable assets nowadays, especially if you're employed in any industry that's kind of based on producing words or symbols for a for the public in any way. You need attention. It's absolutely it's absolutely essential. You 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 can't do any type of business or sustain yourself at all if you're not getting attention at, at at this point in time in history. And I think that's one of the reasons why these blue check marks and all of these people, so many people really who, who do know better, like they're smart and they're, they're capable of honest reflection and they, they absolutely could do better. And, and they probably would like to do better if they could deep down inside, they kind of know that, but they are kind of forced to treat with a lot of respect, this scribbling on the wall of the brothel as DC uh, very aptly put it, they're kind of forced to use that writing on the brothel wall because it drives attention. So they've kind of, they've made this bargain with the devil in some sense that in order mm. to keep like slate.com running or whatever the fuck the place that Jamel Bowie works for, in order to keep that game running, in order to keep his economic prospects alive, he has to basically cooperate with and, and even feed and flatter and, and engage and support this this mob that is essentially just really stupid uh, people writing on the walls of a brothel, and and I, I think that's going to be hard to unwire that because it's it's a kind of hard economic constraint. Well, I mean, I think you could say, Justin, that these actually, I mean, you know, these people work for the guy who owns the brothel is sort of how it works actually, and I there's see. been a yeah. there's been a, I mean, if you try and understand things, you you sort of zoom out from the sort of mimetic spirals that are being generated and in a way stoked daily to understand, you know, why that's happening on a global level. And there's a way in which there are individuals who are involved and they may be more or less reflective, which also means more or less cynical about the role that they're playing in, I would say, the, you know, coarsening of public discourse, to say the least. Because, I mean, the idea, for example, that, you know, this is the business of a journalist, um, I mean, once upon a time, that would have been unthinkable, but this is how it become what journalists now do. They direct, you know, internet hate mobs against Justin Murphy. Why aren't they investigating political corruption, for example? Well, I mean, in a way, they're doing the one so they don't do the other. And I think this is the problem that we're facing on a bigger level because we're dealing with a, somehow it seems to me, increasingly insecure system of power that feels itself unable to legitimate itself any other way except then by saying that, you know, like in a way, après nous la delusion. So, you know, it's like outside of us, we have all of these evil, you know, people and we're just kind of holding the barriers basically. And, and so that's what we're about now. And there isn't a positive vision anymore. And there isn't a sort of sense of, of a higher purpose. It's just a purely reactive purpose. And I wonder how long that can last. Mm, very good question. Now, when we talked last week, we we had a private informal chat about some larger topics and one of you used a phrase that i thought was really enchanting you you used the phrase supernatural toxicity to describe some of what's going on here and i thought that was such a 
interesting and evocative phrase that I made at the title of this live stream. Would either of you or both of you like to tell, tell us all a little bit more about that idea? Yeah, uh, it comes from Roger Calois, who was a, who was a colleague of George Bataille. And actually his phrase, he talks about supernatural contagion. So I um, miss, uh, <laughs> Remembered. misremembered it. But Calwa, Bataille, uh, Michel Léry, uh, some other French intellectuals in the 30s, uh, independent, uh, heterogeneous intellectuals like you, Justin, they used to they used to meet and discuss in a certain way the, the findings of ethnography or attempt to apply the findings of, of ethnography to their own societies, which included questions of the sacred, of, of sacrifice and, you know, magic as well and how that plays itself out in an apparently secular society in a society indeed which you know is still operating following the death of god and is in a way an earlier version of the society that we're, we're in today so Calwa talks about supernatural contagion from the point of view of you know primitive mentality understands uh the possibility of certain kinds of magical forces spiraling very quickly out of control, which is why they have all of these taboos in place to prevent that from happening. And a taboo, it comes from a Polynesian word, it means to mark an intensity. And the point is that, you know, if you don't keep your distance, a certain distance from, from a taboo, then you run the risk of unleashing forces that you can't really understand or control, which then run the risk of actually destroying your whole society. And this is what Gerard talks about as well. And he talks about mimetic contagion very similar concept. It's about some kind of force of violence unleashing itself because of the way in which human beings are based on uh, ideas of mimesis and ideas of, of reflection and identification. So you have to keep things in check, keep things in check through a very ritualistic approach to you know, how you deal with um, these powerful forms of experience that don't have a place in the social order and they can't be given a place in the social order without running the risk of sort of upsetting everything within it. So, you know, things to do with um, death, things to do with sex, things to do with, um, you know, food, things to do with anything to do with desire in a certain way is rendered subject to a taboo and is therefore sort of administrated on this basis. Now, we're living today in a society in which uh, the idea of a taboo has become almost like something unreal. As in, you know, oh, it's just a taboo. It's like meaningless. We live in a way in which, uh, in a world without taboos, a world which is somehow always trying to um, go beyond taboos, which we think that are, are meaningless to us. And the consequences that has been, arguably, to unleash this kind of force of toxicity, the supernatural toxicity that now has nowhere to go. And so it's all of these things that we're no longer actually able to sort of handle in a careful manner are coming back to sort of bite us back. I think that's a really thought provoking model. And I, I quite like a lot of that. One thing I wanted to add to in what you said was when you were describing the the nature of the taboo and what it really means and, and why we have taboos in society, you described it as this kind of informal rule where a society or everyone in a society agrees to not touch certain things or not cross certain boundaries because if someone does that, they're at risk of unleashing a whole bunch of terrible things that they don't fully understand. What I find mm. interesting about that diagnosis, which I think is, is correct, is that I quite agree with that. <laughs> you know, I do think there are demonic forces and a lot of them and human beings are very, very vulnerable uh, to becoming possessed by extremely evil forces that they don't fully understand that can have cata absolutely catastrophic consequences for themselves and, and for the society or civilization. So it's, what, what I think is interesting is I absolutely agree with that. And it's one of the reasons why, I mean, this is a, this is a kind of a factor in my, my Catholicism. This is a fact, this is one of the reasons why I'm an anti-capitalist or communist, because I actually agree that that makes sense. And I think that pr precisely my diagnosis is that, um, somewhere along the line, something went terribly wrong in which what should have been taboo and what should have been respected was all of a sudden torn asunder, primarily by capitalism, right? This is Marx. This is, you know, all that is solid, uh, you know, I forget, <laughs> melts into something, whatever. Um, I haven't read my Marx in a while. Capitalism is the machine that essentially when it takes off, it destroys 
all sacredness, right? It, it makes nothing off limits. If you can turn it into value, then you're then then you're able to do it. And so in some sense, what might be happening, therefore, to kind of extend your analysis, DC, is that precisely because our capacity as a society or as as communities, our capacity to maintain boundaries and taboos on the things that deserve to be tabooed has been so eradicated that what's actually happening now is that all of the people who are liver, living under the catastrophic consequences of this are essentially their evolved needs for taboo, their evolved needs for th these boundaries and scapegoats and, 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 and this whole kind of interior psychological behavioral economy. There, it's playing out in this unconscious way that actually makes no sense from any type of uh, rational, uh, you know, reflective overview of the situation. But they're basically acting out basic needs that capitalism has essentially made it impossible for them to do in the healthy and correct way that actually would be appropriate. Does that make sense to you guys, or what do you think? Um, yes, uh, totally. And I think. You know, I mean, as as you saw with your tweet, I mean, if people start immediately accusing you of paedophilia, which of course you don't defend whatsoever, you know, I mean, from any position and, and you know, and this idea of like, yeah, you project the thing that you think is, should be taboo in a certain way. And of course it absolutely should be, but these kind of borders are being eroded constantly, you know, by, as you say, a certain kind of capitalist culture, which seeks value everywhere, which destroys all the, you know, last remnants of the sacred, you know. Um, yeah, so I mean, I agree. Basically. I mean, I think if you, if you, you know, turn your mind back to the book of Genesis, and of course, the, you know, defining moment when, um, you know, God tells Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of the, uh, knowledge of good and evil and, and they do that and as a consequence they're expelled from from eden and they suddenly find themselves naked it's a very interesting story which has to be somehow studied quite carefully to understand what's going on there but what actually somehow seems to happen in a certain way is they violate this taboo and the effect of violating it is that first of all they're suddenly naked which is to say they're without any law whatsoever and then the second move is that it begins to produce ever new laws. And so you have, you know, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, all kinds of new laws come into play, sort of mini taboos, basically. And that's also what we're kind of dealing with now, because we're facing a situation where, for example, men and women don't necessarily know how to interact with each other in an appropriate way, because customs that previously, uh, in a way, mediated that relation have been have been destroyed and so everybody is transgressing on everybody else's desire and this is what produced also the me too movement because nobody knows what is appropriate anymore right and so mm -hmm. instead of sort of big taboos related to sacred concepts we have micro laws and micro transgressions actually and sort of this is what we're somehow dealing with this sort of attempt somehow to reestablish i think a certain kind of sacredness that would allow us to you know live in a friendlier way yeah i mean i would say like technology also deludes us into thinking we're like radically distant from what is being talked about in the bible and we're not at all and i think this idea that technology is some kind of great salvation you know it it, it doesn't solve the problems that we're talking about at all it just distracts us from them and you know i mean obviously as a as a pagan, I'm, <laughs> you know, I have my own cri criticisms of, of technology, as many people do, and I mean, of, of you know, infinite growth and, and you know, these sorts of fantasies. And I, you know, we have to be very careful when people start kind of engaging in these sort of like, you know, um, I don't know, this idea that we can escape the human. I mean, I don't think it's it's possible, really. I don't know what you think. That's a really good point i want to bring up a question that was raised in the chat which i think is it's not so much a question but it's a kind of an interesting point which is that someone said that leftism is dionysian and i think there's just a there's an interesting puzzle here which i want to kind of uh unwrap and and hear what you guys have to say about it but basically in some sense like i agree with you nina i'm i'm very interested in the dionysian and i'm I, when I when I think about it and in my understanding of it, I think mostly about the kind of emancipatory kind of pro-social impacts and, and and consequences of it. And in some sense, I see what I'm doing and I see what people like you two are doing and all like kind of radical thinkers who are willing to take some licks for it. I see that as kind of practicing the Dionysian 
um, in, in some sense, I see that on the side of the Dionysian, but in another sense, I can see how a lot of people think that the Dionysian is precisely the problem of how we all got here, right? Like people are allowed to do whatever they want. People are allowed to um, be free to basically uh, pursue their their excessive desires. Um, so in some sense, th there's a weird, there's a, there's something weird going on there. And and it's an interesting puzzle for how to think about the, Di the Dionysian and its kind of ideological character. I don't have an answer, but I'm curious. If you, first of all, do you see the the kind of weird tension or confusion I'm describing? First of all, and mm -hmm. if you do, um, perhaps you have some interesting thoughts on how to make sense of that. Um, yeah, just briefly, I, th I think that you know the Dionysian historically is is controlled. I mean, it's not like you know mundane. It's precisely the opposite. I mean, if you know when you're talking about the kind of temporary dissolution of the individual and that you know in the in the collective you know that this is a this is has to be a carefully controlled ritual experience mm. you know it's not something that can be you know or should be dispersed into a kind of uh, generic ca capitalist consumerist hedonist you know liberalism or something or whatever you want to call it you know i'm also being criticized for calling myself a pagan it's true that pagans wouldn't call themselves a pagan i i'm also repeating greta thunberg's uh, infinite growth is, is a fantasy yeah it's true <laughs> You just gave me a funny idea, this total random tangent, that what if I could find a 16-year-old young woman who's, like, really into my ideas, and I kind of, like, paid her to be, like, a spokesperson and go around, like, talking about my crazy stuff uh, really passionately and emotionally? Like, could you imagine how how much people would freak out? <laughs> I think you should do it, Justin. <laughs> I don't think you should do it. <laughs> uh, DC, did you have any thoughts on what I just said, this kind of weird ideological confusion around the Dionysian and 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 the role of the, Di the, the Dionysian. I think what Nina just said is kind of interesting because it essentially, what Nina just said has the same structure of what you said, DC, about Genesis and, and, and taboo that, you know, there is a kind of originary taboo that really should be respected. And if that is broken, then what happens is you don't escape the nature of taboo. You just now have a million random scattered taboos that no one knows how to order or 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 prioritize. What Nina said about the Dionysian is it, it seems like it has a similar structure. Are we kind of onto something here that a lot of these issues have something to do with the structure of an original form of it is good, but when that is broken down, when those walls are 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 broken down and everything escapes, then the evolved need or desire for these things, the way they actually manifest themselves, turns out being the opposite of what we want, the opposite of what they were supposed to be. Is something like that going on? Or do you have any thoughts? Well, I think it's difficult in some ways to try to combine the you know, Greek religion with the anthropological taboo structure, right? So I don't actually know what a taboo is exactly in, in ancient Greece, but I think that if you, for example, read Dumazil, you know, Dumazil describes in, in ancient Roman religion, which is somewhat similar, you know, very specific sets of codes governing the relations between people in specific spaces, um, between different kinds of people. And Dionysus is one such mode of being, right? So it's not just like a kind of, um, yeah, sort of generally lackadaisical approach to things actually it's a very specific dedication to a very specific kind of force really mm -hmm. it's also in haiti to some extent you know you you do things that dionysus in a sense mandates for you within certain specific circumstances so i don't think that what we have today is really anything like that and i think that for example you know in a situation where people are let's say just like drinking on a very kind of dully routinized basis. You know, that's not a Dionysian experience, actually. That's something that is to do with an instrumentalized relationship to the sacred, actually, which therefore mm. destroys the sacred, which, um, you know, renders mundane what should be understood as a super mundane and therefore even actually a sort of superhuman force. It has to be then an experience of that force to be, to be, to be coherent, you know? And so, yeah, there's a certain reading of, of Nietzsche, basically, um, the birth of tragedy, where you oppose the Apollonian as a certain kind of idea of almost like a order. order, sort of, um, you know, even like a kind of very sort of 
stuck kind of like rigidness with the wild Dionysian sort of Woodstock excess. But I think both of these things actually have to be considered in a much more um, intertwined way, really, you know. Mm. And it's about understanding that actually reality is composed out of these different forces, which have to each, in a sense, be sort of respected. You know, you sacrifice to, to both of these altars because you understand that there is a Dionysian power, there is an Apollonian power, and it's not about reducing the one to the other or uh, insisting upon the sort of the supremacy of, for example, Dionysus over everybody else, but of understanding these things are in balance. Nina, in our conversation last week, you invoked a really interesting concept. You used the word malamat. Would you be able to tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, well, not that much more. Um, okay. I suppose my, my friend uh, Lewis, um, who uh, runs Morbid Books, which is an excellent um, outfit, very, uh, very interesting, free thinking um, uh, and yeah, a loyal and honest uh, guy, in fact. And he mentioned this concept to me as a as a kind of uh, like a spiritual process, I suppose, of of in a sense undergoing a certain form of kind of public humiliation. And it's very interesting if you think about Kierkegaard, because Kierkegaard, in a sense, most likely got himself cancelled kind of deliberately as a sort of strange act, existential act. Um, and there is something kind of, you know, I don't know, again, it goes back to this point about this sort of like uh, the ordeal, the experience of the ordeal. What does it mean to divest oneself in a certain way of all of those things that you're supposed to care about? And like, so, for example, I'm sure you've had this experience when I speak to um, academics about leaving academia, you get this uh, immediate double move where they're kind of both like immediately envious, but then also kind of like think, oh, my God, but thank God I, I still have my job. You know, there is this kind of like double move of like, well, imagine the freedom. But then on the other hand, like, you know, no, I can do it. And and so that kind of, uh, yeah, I don't know. That yeah. I, I suppose, like, what does it mean to kind of like get rid of or lose or drop everything that you think you care about in a certain way to right. reevaluate? to reevaluate what it is you actually do value yourself. I mean, it's sort of like sounds very niche in, I suppose, but yeah. I mean, what is it that we want? What is it that we care about? Who is it that we like, you know, all these sorts of questions. Right. Who's yeah. The reason I thought this concept of Malamat was very interesting is because it comes from a different kind of cultural lineage, but it's very reminiscent of this concept of Parisia, which you both know I'm very interested in. Mm -hmm. When I was in London, you two kindly invited me to give a talk at the Invisible College. And I, I gave a talk on this concept of Parisia because I've been studying this for quite some time. And in particular, Foucault's last lectures uh, are largely about this concept and the role that it played and, and its kind of function and how it worked as a mechanism, really, um, in ancient Greece, in particular, the Greco-Roman world. And Parisi has this concept that is very similar to Malamat in the sense that, as Foucault shows, it requires a kind of costly confrontation. Like you have to, you have to accept that people are going to dislike you and that there will be punishment for it. That's actually a, a foundational part of what Parisia is. And by the way, I, I should just give a quick summary. I mean, it's basically free speech. Um, it, tra it gets translated in a few different ways, frank speech, or, uh, you know, there are a few different ways of, of, turning it into contemporary English, but it pretty much means that type of excessive, provocative truth telling that most normal people in most contexts don't do because there are social costs to it. And, but this, but in the, in the Greco Roman world, they had a concept for this and they were quite conscious that this was a particular type of activity. It wasn't just a normal type of speech. It was a different kind of thing. And they, understood quite explicitly that it was essentially a political mechanism that but but it's just interesting because one of the defining features of it is getting some type of punishment uh, you know if you don't get some kind of punishment it by definition it can't be parisia and, and it can't be malamat if i understand the concept correctly and so i just want to kind of i think that's really interesting and important to remind people especially people who are very afraid of getting you know, a hate mob on them or getting canceled or fired or whatever the case might be, losing friends or whatever. Well, if you want to be a philosopher or a true intellectual of any kind, you have to face it that this type of social opprobrium is an absolute requirement. It's, it's a part of the game. And I think when we start to realize that, that there's a, a long, rich, formidable and, and impressive history of it, a self-conscious history of, of people in, 
in, engaging in this type of behavior. For instance, Jesus Christ himself used the word parisia in Mark. It, it's in, in the Gospels of Mark. It's very interesting. It's when Peter is telling Jesus, he's saying, you know, okay, your ideas are really cool, dude, but do you really have to go around saying them in public where like all the, uh, you know, law enforcers can hear you? You know, Peter's kind of saying like, maybe tone it down just a little bit. Like you can still be totally honest about everything, everything you're saying, but you don't have to go out of your way for, you know, the, the, the Roman police state to hear you because they're, they're going to kill you, dude. Like chill out a little bit is what Peter is saying. And what Jesus says is he invokes the term parisia in his response where he says, he essentially says, I'm obviously paraphrasing wildly, he says something to the effect of, no, I understand that, but that's part of the game and I need to do that. Is how I is how I read it anyway. And so so it's very, very interesting. And I think when people understand that this is a tradition and a lot of the great figures, intellectuals or political activists that most of us admire and, and, and have extraordinary kind of respect in our minds today still, when you realize a lot of those people were self-consciously engaging in Parisia and Parisia requires this kind of social opprobrium, all of a sudden, I think it gives people a lot more confidence and courage and, and energy and motivation to to take these risks and to and to speak dangerous truths wherever they might find themselves because you're in good company if you do that. Yeah, I really agree with you, Justin. I think that what you say about games is highly relevant. It's a question in a certain way of, of their game versus our game in a way. And you know, there's a game that, for example, a, a blue check plays whereby they sacrifice their ability to tell the truth in exchange for a certain amount of material status, which they then enjoy. Now, if people want to do that, that's what they want to do. But I think that, in fact, one does gain more spiritually, ultimately, by attempting to attune oneself to what reality is really like. And so, you know. Hell yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's Nick Land's concept of the outside. That's why he's kind of organized so much of his stuff around this this idea or notion of the outside. That's exactly what it is. I think it's a matter of attuning yourself to that which is real, that which really exists. And that's essentially a kind of radical outside. Like we never really get there. We're just constantly trying to make contact and calibrate ourselves towards this, this absolute outside that reality is. And if you just commit to doing that, then you have a solid ground. You have something to to stand on and you have you have truths to at least pursue and and no one can really throw you off that it, you have an anchor in other words that's not dependent on bullshit social contingencies and if you don't have that if you don't commit to a kind of fidelity to the truth of reality which is this kind of radical outside then you're inevitably going to be blown around by the winds of fashion and 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 politics i think the way is parisia is translated is is fearless speech and so in a way you have a choice between fearful speech and fearless speech. And mm -hmm. it's up to everybody to make that choice. Really. Because the truth is that a lot of people are very afraid. But there's also, on some level, nothing to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. Well put. Now, what we also talked about a little bit in our conversation was, DC, you invoked something that you called the manifesto of canceled art. Would you like to talk a little bit more about that? Oh, uh, this is a work in progress. But I mean, it relates to the notion of uh, there being, in a way, something relevant in the act of cancellation, let's say, that then reveals certain kinds of uh, truths or uh, intensities that might be interesting for other reasons. And I think that in the last few years, somehow, as the sort of mechanism has, has intensified, you know, you've seen more and more people getting cancelled for less and less in a certain way and also some people taking taking risks and other people taking no risks you know and so therefore the question of where the risks are being taken and therefore also you know where the reality is located is i think a question that's sort of facing our culture generally speaking at this moment because you know that is actually the the true battle i would say it's not between um, even, you know, the left or the right necessarily, because these terms are also quite confusing and mean different things to different people, is between a certain kind of willingness and desire for the real, passion for the real, as Alan Badu used to say, um, versus a, a fear of that same thing, you know? And who is willing to put themselves in the firing line for the sake of the real? I think these are the people that, 
personally, you know, I want to meet and I want to know what they have to say. And everybody else, I can care less, to be honest. So is this manifesto, is this a thing yet? Or is this just an idea? Or is it already out there? Or And is it a larger kind of project behind it? Or what do you think of it as? I think the question, again, is, you know, what comes after cancel culture in a certain way? You know, what comes after this sort of very repressive situation, this very suffocating atmosphere that anybody who has spent any time around contemporary culture instantly feels the moment that they walk into, you know, an art gallery or a contemporary art museum, they feel this 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 repressive atmosphere. And it's almost like the sedimentation of all of the compromises that everybody involved has had to make, you know, in the course of, of pursuing their own agendas to get wherever they wanted to get to, which is here, which is nowhere. You know, and every revolution in art is in a way a return to realism. And I think we are going to see a return to realism because I think that there are more and more people who feel correctly, first of all, that the rewards to be gained from maintaining allegiance to this system are actually very minor compared to what can be gained, even if it's just simply nothing from just saying so, you know, so long to it and, and trying to find something different and new mm. and beautiful in the outside. Olaf here makes a good point in the chat when he says that, at least this is the way I understand the point, is that one of the reasons why the ancient mechanisms that kind of made sense worked, one of the reasons that they did work but no longer work possibly is that the martyrdom attraction is perhaps been weakened. I, I wonder if that's true. We could debate that, I think. But it, it is an interesting hypothesis. I do get the point here. Like Olaf seems to be saying part of the problem is there used to be kind of social benefits. Um, intellectual historical impact benefits to being a martyr like if you you know went down in a blaze of glory you could count on being celebrated and remembered by all of posterity at least that was a, a live attraction whereas now maybe one of the reasons or one of the many mechanisms feeding into what's going on right now to understand the the overarching machinery that we are embedded in now is that people are less confident of those martyrdom rewards in like the secular west so people feel like it's not worth it to die on some hill defending like free speech. Like they don't want to lose their fancy professorship because, you know, in order to uh, make a point because in some sense, perhaps they calculate that everyone remember, everyone forgets everything so quickly. Like no one's really going to be impressed by it. No one's really going to admire them or care or remember. So they feel like it's not worth taking a stand. I think, I think that's an interesting question. It's possibly, um, that's possibly one, one part of all of this. I think I think before all that social question though, there's the question of whether you can live with yourself first and foremost, which seems mm. to me like the most important one. Like whether you can, I don't know, stay at yourself and look at everything you've said and done, and you know, acknowledge the good, the bad, the ugly, and I don't know to somehow understand to some extent, to the extent that it's possible, and psychoanalysis who has something to say about this. You know, but then, I mean, if you're not afraid to look at yourself in the first place or to live with yourself, you know, to, to be able to live with yourself, like to be at some kind of peace insofar as this is possible, then, for example, you're, well, most importantly, you're not afraid to die, right? And I think so much of this contemporary discourse is around this fear of finitude, which is a very, like, key thing to manipulate. Of course, it's like the most manipulated thing in the world, you know, is like people's fear of their own death. You know, but when people are afraid of dying, it's because they're afraid of themselves, first and foremost. They're afraid that they haven't they're done what they want to do, that they're not as good a person as they want to be or all of those sorts of things. You know, so I think in the first place, I, I don't know, it doesn't matter what anyone thinks. I mean, in a sense, none of this really matters in a certain way, like 200 years time, 2000 years. Time, I mean, who knows? Right. Mm -hmm. It's not kind of important, this idea of posterity so much as like whether you can, I don't know, look at yourself somehow. Yeah. Yeah. And to, I mean, to pick up on that, I think nobody is necessarily recognized as a martyr at the time or a dissident at the time. They don't say, you know, for example, Jan Potochka is a famous dissident. They say he's like an asshole and a fascist. That's how they describe him at the time. You know, subsequently we say, OK, oh, you know, this guy actually had had a good idea. You know, we, we, we should respect him. But like the status of of being a dissident isn't isn't really an enjoyable one if you're actually there right it's this mm -hmm. is this that you have you have the status of a pariah actually and the question is whether you're willing to uh accept that 
in exchange for respect from other people who you also respect because they've also shown a certain amount of courage themselves. And I think, you know, that's what it's about to some degree. It's about, you know, who you want respect from. And mm. an interesting story, of course, the story of, you know, Abraham sacrificing Isaac in the Bible, which I think about sometimes, but, you know, God tells Abraham, sacrifice your son who you love. And Abraham goes and, and he and he does it. And many people can't understand this today because they <laughs> say so they say, you know, like, why why would anybody do that? And the point is because actually to sort of disobey God is the worst thing that you could possibly do, even if it costs you everything else. And so this is somehow I think what, what Abraham understood. Well right. it's obviously a you know, exchange for a burnt offering, right? But I mean, obviously he's going to do it, right? Yeah. Is the point, yeah. It's he's a really willing. good point, yeah. I think what's what's encoded in that that people can understand by translating into translating it into a slightly non-religious framework is a lot of people just, they don't like religion or they identify as an atheist or agnostic or whatever. And so stories from the Bible don't really get through to them. So sometimes I like to do this kind of translation game where I put it into a more kind of materialist uh, translation and and I think you guys make a really good point on on that in particular because the translation there is if you don't say what you really think it is going to have negative consequences on you that are much larger than you think even if they're kind of diffuse and they're hard to understand and normal rational materialist modern civilization doesn't really have words for it it's going to happen anyway whether you like it or not it's happening in the background of your soul there's a kind of real very real corrosion of the spirit and of the will and of the soul that really does set in and and it's it's a it's it sometimes can be a kind of more deep and severe kind of cancer almost that than than people realize and and it's real people just don't acknowledge it they don't observe it in themselves and they don't admit that it's a real thing happening to them when they don't say what they really think and they don't acknowledge it because in our society if it's not a kind of like material entity that is named and known by scientists and, and blue check mark journalists, then people don't trust it. But I think if people can really kind of look inside themselves, you can introspectively identify this. You can, you can realize what happens to you when you're, when, when you're kind of performing this like public identity, this kind of public speech that isn't really you being true. Uh, you, you know, you, you really can feel it. But I think my final point here is just that, one of the most radical and effective ways simply to feel it, to, to understand what's going on, is to experiment with transgression. Because in some sense, the only way you get a kind of measurement of, of how corrosive this is on yourself is by getting some kind of contrast. A lot of people don't have that contrast. They don't know what it feels like to tell your boss what you really think. And so because they don't know that feeling of, of a kind of a, a true, courageous, just act of honesty or whatever the case might be, and you can imagine many other ways of doing it or many other examples, without a, a taste of that extraordinary, exhilarating, positive feeling that you get from, from that, people don't have anything to, to compare uh, against the kind of the kind of low level constant suffering that they that they actually are experiencing on a daily basis. And and I think that's this is a really, really important point for people to to realize. It's like Nina often says, you know, many people, uh, they don't believe their lives are real. They don't mm. think they're alive with them. They think they're wow. in some other kind of universe where, where nothing they do matters and nothing they, they say counts. You know? That's so true. That's, so, that's a really, really powerful phrase there. People don't know their lives are real. Whereas, in fact, their lives are one of the only things that's real. And all of the things that they're currently preoccupied mm. with, like most people today, the way they're kind of most people are kind of living in this just frantic uh, kind of digitally mediated zombie mode, they they take as real a million things that are in fact meaningless and will be forgotten by everyone in a few days. And I think that's a that's a really powerful phrase that really kind of cuts cuts to the heart of it. Yeah, that's something. A, please. Please. Oh, this is, um, Olaf says about, you know, yes, but I have a, a kid, I have kids and a wife, so it's not my own death I fear, it's letting them down, you know, and this question of, like, responsibility to others. Yeah, I mean, it's it's absolutely true, and a lot of people have this, and in a way, like, I've 
avoided these things as some philosophers do <laughs> uh, for various reasons, right? And I, I, you know, but I absolutely, this is really important point because actually what comes first is one's loyalty and one's duty to people that you've made these kind of promises to. And in a sense, you are responsible to them, right? And I, I mean, those those things come with such an extraordinary weight. And, and I think to actually think through those things as well, I mean, it's almost like, I don't know, extremely um, intense. And I don't know, people maybe, I don't know, I mean, how we can't take these things lightly, right? These are the most serious commitments that we make, mm -hmm. actually. Um, and so I, I, so I don't really have an answer, but I just wanted to acknowledge this this point that is of course it's easier as a a person on your own to talk about you know your own you know relation to freedom this vertiginous freedom your own death and so on but when you have other responsibilities i mean again this is why people you can keep them in certain ways because they do have these real bonds of of love and duty and care but i'm not sure that changes anything in a way i mean first of all because nobody is necessarily called to do anything specific it's a question of whether somebody feels like their life is is real and true and you know maybe that's a family life nobody has to be an hero you know and there's a difference mm -hmm. between let's say um what would be a courageous act for one man might be a reckless act for someone else Right. Also, in another way, sometimes, I mean, obviously, every individual's case is different, and I would never give generalized advice on on this. But in my case, at least, there there are cases in which doing the quote unquote responsible thing to take care of a family, for instance, can sometimes in the long run actually be a real betrayal of those people that you feel most obligated to. Because in, in my case, for instance, like academia was making me a, a shell of a person. Like I was losing precisely what made me uh, a worthwhile husband, really. Like the my, my precisely what all of the good things that I was a, that I'm most able to give to my wife, for instance, to make our lives joyous and and real and and authentic. All of those capacities were being enervated by academia. So like when I came to my kind of final decision, my kind of final conflict where she was really hitting the fan and I had to, I had to make a choice. I had to go all in one way or the other. I actually, part of the reason why I decided to just, um, go full speed ahead and get canceled as gloriously as possible was because I actually felt like it was, that was a kind of fidelity to my wife and to my family in some sense, because if I didn't do that, if I chose the quote unquote responsible thing, just to keep the paycheck flowing. I know I knew for sure that over the next 50 years I would become a kind of um less and less uh a powerful and positive force in the life of everyone I actually care about. And so that's something really to keep in mind. I think a lot of people justify their this kind of slow submission to a kind of absolute corrosive uh engagement with the world on the grounds that they're doing a favor to people that rely mm -hmm. on them or that are dependent on them and sometimes that might be the case i'm definitely not telling everyone to defect oh, recklessly but it's not at all true that that's always the case and sometimes the opposite is true and uh, people really fail to realize that i think sometimes yeah i mean there's a kind of courage and simply daring to think certain thoughts you know yeah now one of the things that i think you and i you too and and i that we're all really interested in is you you said it a little bit before dc about what comes after cancel culture trying to think about about yeah what what is the next step especially now that there are people like us who have kind of been through the cancellation process and and you know pretty dramatically we all have our own stories about that and, and they're different but we all what w the three of us have in common is that we went through that trial if you will and we made it out the other side and not only did we make it out the other side we are we're still we're still kicking right and here we are on the internet we're talking no one can really stop us on some level and you know at the beginning of this i asked i asked you too how are you feeling do you see you said you're all right i'm all right you know in some sense now we're in this new stage where large numbers of very interesting uh cool people have have gone through the trial and now they're on the other side and they really have nothing to lose and now there's a lot of us <laughs> right so in some sense and I'm very passionately interested right now in 
in what to do with that, like what comes next. And so I'm my wheels are spinning rapidly about how to create different types of structures. I don't have a very, very kind of strong vision yet. I'm, I'm, I have a very open mind to it, but I think this is a really rife and and productive area of discussion and debate to kind of bring in into the public sphere. I would love to hear more about if you guys have any thoughts on that. Well, I think it's important to recognize that we do actually have to defeat something uh, because two things could come after cancel culture. And Geo says one of them, which is gulags. You know, I mean, there is still this kind of extremely powerful repressive mechanism, which is running more or less unconsciously, um, which is in a way automated also by algorithms to some degree. So how do we throw a spanner into the works of that machine? I mean, this is also what we're somehow trying to do by uh, taking matters to the law. Heraclitus says men should defend the law as if it was the city walls. And I think that in a way to try and reintroduce a certain kind of question of the law, to reintroduce also a certain kind of relation to rituals, to an enchanted world, to a world which is real in its enchantment. You know, these are projects that we have to pursue, actually, because I don't think that we've won yet by any means, you know. And there's a question of how courageous people are ultimately prepared to be. Now, you know, I think that there's a false impression that one could get from the internet because there are many people who are prepared to say things under pseudonyms that are more or less radical and transgressive, but within the daily contexts, you know, actually live in a kind of quite um, frightened way. And how much are people going to be willing to defend some kind of reality for real is, I think, the question that we're going to see answered in the next decade. Nina, anything on that? I don't want to jump in too quick. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I'm interested in a certain kind of, um, I don't know, that sort of nuanced de-escalation, a kind of like uh, various forms of kind of sympathy, and empathy. I mean, in all these conversations I'm having in real life with people, you know, of course, everything is much more complicated and far less starkly posed as it might appear on the internet, for example. And I, I suppose that kind of re-enchantment of each other, I suppose I'm interested as a collective social project, you know, what does it mean to sit and have a conversation? I mean, this is like the most beautiful thing in the world. And I mean, in a platonic sense to have a dialogue with somebody that you can speak to or listen to, you know, even just to listen to somebody. I mean, it's incredibly simple in some way, but we rarely like do it with any time or any joy. So I suppose to, to kind of, um, I don't know, contemplation and nature and listening as and, and humor and nuance and all these things. I'm very interested in how we might gently use these as kind of techniques against this kind of very paranoiac, fanatical, fierce, you know, mode of being, which is, you know, and if you think about um, fascism, historical fascism, you know, these are these this are, these are forms of paranoia. These are forms of, gr you know, group hatred predicated on a certain kind of uh, a uh, paranoid, egomaniac sort of vision of the world. And in a way, we, we need to diffuse these, like to, to, mm -hmm. to work out techniques to diffuse these paranoiac spirals, you know, to avoid uh, group denunci denunciation, denunciation by the group, but also the construction of groups that then become the objects of hatred. I see. That's really good. So I, I now I understand a little bit better about your kind of the underlying rationale or political logic of of how you're thinking, which is, if I understand you correctly, your project that you're undertaking right now, the, what is it called? The animosity, the, what is it? Oh, amity animosity. So it's yeah. like anyone can yeah. come and talk to you. Basically. Right, right. Say it one more time, you broke up for a second. Sorry, it's called um, amity animosity. That's and right. Basically, I just have a conversation with anyone, like it could be a stranger and they just say, do you want to, you know, let's meet. And then I go and meet them and, and we talk and it's not recorded other than in our hearts, which is the original recording device. And that's where we get the word record from, from core, from, from heart. And so yeah, it, it's just an attempt. It's just, but it's very beautiful. It's very, it is very real to, to just to listen and to speak to somebody. And it's so different from 
even what we're doing now you know i wish we were in the same room justin you know yeah me too i mean i i yeah i, I think back so fondly all the time to my two weeks that i spent uh my yeah, last two, my last two weeks in england spent it with you i think very fondly about that all the time actually and your wife aria she's also so wonderful you uh, know? i'll pass on the message that's very sweet <laughs> And so real quick, is that a public project like open to anyone can contact you for this or is it, are there constraints? Um, yeah, it's, it's public. I mean, there's a logistical question of like, you know, obviously I'm in London most of the time and, you know, I, I, <laughs> you know, I have to allow time because it's also about time. You know, I don't, I don't want to rush any of these meetings. So I, I leave them open-ended to a certain extent. I don't try and fit that many in, but it's running until December. And then I want to write a reflective piece about friendship. And hopefully that's, it's open-ended also. So it's and kind of just my existentialist art project, basically. Right on. <laughs> and if anyone here is listening to this and they're in London, if they wanted to apply to enter this uh, experiment, is there a way that they can do, how should they do that? Um, yeah, it's on my website, ninapower.net, I guess. And it, they just email me. And it's also because I asked all the people who were denouncing me anonymously and writing open letters to meet me in the park to talk about it, you know, because everyone was doing it like anonymously. And I was like, come on, just like sign the letter or come and speak to me. Like, let's discuss our disagreements, you know, and it's sort of a point about about the real, you know, it's about meeting. And of course, they didn't come. I mean, other people came to the park. We had a nice talk. But <laughs> You know, I, I kind of, I don't know, maybe I want this like direct communication. It's more complicated in real life. You know? Right. So what I understand about this project now that we've talked about it, because we haven't talked about it since you launched it, is your rationale is you're trying to kind of apply a lever to this cultural malaise at the level of individuals kind of frustrated needs. And you're thinking, as you described it, if I understand you correctly, is to create experiments among ourselves in which we can facilitate kind of the satisfaction of the more basic drives and needs that we all have to speak with each other, to have face-to-face -face contact, to be honest, to be listened to. Uh, your theory is kind of if we can create more cultures of that kind of thing, then it will, it will kind of exhaust and undercut these nasty pent-up frustrations that are one of the sources of all of these higher level uh, kind of aggregate problems. Is that a fair way to summarize your thinking about that i mean you make it sound too grandiose i mean it's much smaller and i'm just one one person right but it is, but if, it but is if everyone did that right i mean but people do do this i mean this is the other thing i mean this is happening all the time and, and you not know, enough most, right i mean i think i think we get a mis uh, image a wrong image of the world if we just think oh these you know the few people online who you know it's a very unbalanced image you know you go mm. you you go online and, and you're like ah and then you go outside and it's like where is this happening actually it's just you you're kind to of people you say hello you know i know i sound like very um i don't know overly hippie-ish or something like this but it's a very simple point i'm making about uh, you know like personal contact and and really it's happening all the time already and just more of it to so that people can express also yeah like you say these these difficult feelings that we all have you know sometimes and quite often now Do you see you got anything on this? I don't want to jump in too quick. Um, on what exactly? Oh, um, just basically now we're kind of discussing strategies and tactics for what comes after cancel culture. Like, so for instance, you, you mm. can think about that, but, and you don't, you might not have anything. It's fine. But in some sense, your, your manifesto, when you spoke to that, you were, you were already speaking to that. You might not have anything else to add, which is fine. Um, but what I would say, for instance, like what I'm really interested in at the moment is thinking about the kind of political and organizational question of what to do with all of these cool, interesting, smart, courageous people who have already passed through the trial of cancellation. And they're still alive. They're still thinking, you know, they're still out there and they're not, they might've been, you know, set back in some sort of way that's more or less dramatic materially or whatever. But there are a large number of people like us, like people like Angela Nagel, and, and you can think of many, many more who, they survived their their trial. In other words, they survived their parisiastic ordeal or their you know malamat experience or what have you. And now, what do we what do what do we types of people do? Um, is there a way to? Mm -hmm. Certainly, there seems to be uh, many opportunities for these types of people to uh, have a have a much better and more connected network. For instance, that seems like an obvious opportunity that hasn't really been solved yet. Like just making ways for these people to talk with each other more frequently to to kind of share information, share plans and, and collaborate or cooperate or whatever. And also just to kind of keep people motivated and positive and confident. I mean, like one conversation with you two or one conversation with 
Angela Nagel is enough for me to like basically forget completely about whatever kind of psychological setbacks might have been caused by all the hate mail yesterday. I'm like, I, I'm already just by talking with you two for an hour, I'm completely reset, motivated, completely. It's like it's all been washed away. And this is extremely powerful kind of you know, social technology that we need to all learn how to do with each other and for each other, I think much more frequently. So that's that's kind of the political uh, piece of this puzzle that my mind is most interested in. Like the other day I saw, I was just for fun of it, I was looking through domain names uh, that have the word cancellation or canceled in them. And uh, just, I don't know what I'm gonna do with it yet. It's just kind of harebrain uh, scheme, but I bought the domain canceled.vip. <laughs> so I own that now. And I'm kind of thinking like, um, I'm just starting to kind of brainstorm like how we could create kind of interesting and and supportive, but also in a way like provocative and kind of carrying on the the fight in a way, um, in a way that's kind of public and antagonistic somewhat, but also kind of careful um, of, of, yeah, basically saying like, look, cancellation is not the end of the world. There are ways to, to win it even, um, or at least ways to seriously minimize the damage and po possibly even transition into a whole better type of life. I mean, that's still my wager. Like, I still believe that that's what I'm doing. And I think I'm winning. Like, I genuinely believe that in a year or two, in every dimension, my intellectual life and my material life and my emotional and personal life, everything is going to be significantly measurable, measurably better than it was in academia. And I think the more people can do that and kind of show it and demonstrate it, it's going to do serious damage to the fears that people have. It's going to really empower people um, to to defect from from this kind of nasty escalating uh, trap of of witch hunting that we're that we're now kind of embedded in. So that's I'm just sharing with you. That's kind of the angle, the kind of political piece of the puzzle that I'm kind of most interested in. But you guys might be interested in others. Like it sounds like Nina's attacking it from a different angle or thinking about it from a different angle. So uh, have we exhausted everything on this question or no? I think our responsibility no. is to try and create a, a healthier and a, and a more joyful culture. For, for those who want to be a part of it. And if we can do that, then what else do we need to do? Well put, well put. We've been talking for quite some time and I don't wanna overtax you guys. I know it's late in England. Uh, do you, is there anything else that you two uh, were really amped to to get out there, to get off your chest or, or no? Have we covered uh, everything we were hoping to cover? I think I'm, I'm, I'm all, all good. Yeah. Nina? Oh, yeah. It was it was nice to see you again. Yeah. It was lovely. This was really, really uh premium content, I would say. <laughs> this is really cool. And I, I think we should just um or I will uh briefly remind people that Nina and DC are currently mounting a legal campaign ag against Luke Turner. Um am I correct in that you, you basically want to sue him for libel, is it? And harassment. And harassment. Okay, right. So they're raising money for this because lawyers are expensive, obviously. So if this is something that you're passionate about and you want to help people like Nina and DC experiment with legal strategies for kind of waging this kind of cultural battle that we're all immersed in, whether we like it or not, if that's something that you're really in interested in, there's a link in the description below. Um, I think they do still need a, a few thousand dollars more to hit their goal in a few days. So uh, please, if you're if you have money and you're interested in that, please consider uh, supporting them. I'm very interested to see how their how their plan pans out. And I think people should be trying all different types of strategies to try to uh, kind of uh, redress these these cultural pathologies that we're involved in now. But um, other than that, uh, I think you two are are free to go if you if you'd like to uh, feel free to add anything if you want. But I'm very grateful for having you on. Uh, you're always really interesting and inspiring to talk to. Thanks for having us, Justin. All right, I'll let you go now. All right. Should All I right. do the wall again? No. All right, okay. Oh, wait. I'll do it. You don't have to. I don't care. I could care less. The insanity is so stupid that um, I just think it's funny. But anyway, yeah, all right. I know what that meant anyway, yeah. What did you say, Nina? <laughs> I said, obviously, I didn't know what that meant. Like Just when, a cute little one. I know, but like, you know, anyway, this whole paranoia and like this thing, you know, just want to say like... You know. It's insane. It's insane. Real quick, before I let you go, for anyone who has no idea what I'm talking about, in our last live stream that I did several months with Nina in DC, we were just talking about a million different random things, as always. And uh, at some point, I don't even remember who cares what the context was, but we were talking about this like hand signal or whatever. Um, and we were doing it just like to demonstrate it, to talk about it. And this became like an object of scandal immediately after. Uh, people seriously are stupid enough to think that we were doing like 
uh, fascist hand signaling that is associated with a Turkish group. People seriously seem to th seem to think that. Uh, anyway, I find it so kind of hilariously stupid that I have, I have no problem uh, provoking those types of people. But um, anyway, be that as it may. So Nina and DC, thanks again. I'm going to let you guys go now, and uh, I hope to talk to with you soon. Okay. Take care, Justin. Bye, All right, Justin. Later. All right. If you haven't done so already, please do subscribe to my channel. I have these types of conversations all the time and they're pretty cool. So also, if you are interested, I should let you know that I recently published Based Deleuze, my first kind of totally independent book project experiment. It's just a short book, about 22,000 words. And uh, I'm really pleased with it. Actually, in fact, I want to talk a little bit about it because it's kind of interesting as a case study. I'm not selling you the book. I'm interested in how people can do this stuff and what types of results you can expect. And I was pleasantly surprised so far by the by the outcomes. I think I wrote it down actually. I I, I sold 237 books with absolutely no institutional affiliation or institutional support of any kind. And I made about so far fourteen hundred dollars. So I'm I'm quite proud of that. I think that's a pretty damn good result for what was just a kind of early opening salvo in my experiments with independently funding my own intellectual work. And so, yeah, and I'm not super famous, you know, so I think this bodes well for, you know, the prospects of truly independent, crowdfunded, but serious highbrow intellectual work. Uh, and I quite like the book too. I'm, I'm quite proud of it. You know, I did it and I tried to make it accessible. I tried to kind of write it in a way that was realistic with the types of people that would be buying it. And, and it, it's definitely got some weird aspects to it that make it a bit different than a normal academic book. But I gave all of the kind of energy and uh, focus and kind of intellectual investment that I would have given like a published academic journal article that I've written in the past. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, proud, to, I'm proud of it because I think it's, uh, there are not many artifacts that exist on the web quite yet today that have kind of the intellectual stature of a, a serious professional academic like I am, but that are written with absolute freedom and can take some weird risks. And I think, you know, it's, it's for that reason, it's got a really, it's got a bunch of really interesting uh, kind of angles that, and I'm not saying I'm like super smart or anything. They're not necessarily good. I'm not, I'm not saying that, I'm, but they're definitely interesting in the sense that I'm able to explore certain angles of, of Deleuze that literally I would never have been able to think about, let alone write about in academic publishing of any kind. And it's not even political sensitivity that I'm talking about. It's just generalized kind of uh, narrow focus of vision that has kind of emerged or evolved in academia. So I'm not saying I like, you know, broke some kind of like amazing sacred taboo or something like that and unleashed some like powerful secret suppressed knowledge of Deleuze. I'm not playing it up like that. I'm, what I'm saying is I was just able to explore angles and ask questions and, and play around with certain ideas that it was very palpable to me. I simply never would have uh, enabled myself to to play with basically. Uh, and and I, so it was a really cool experience and I thought I'm really quite pleased with it. So yeah, I'll be writing up a little bit more about it. I want to kind of do a little post game report about it. Um, by the way, I see DC and Nina, you are in the background. You're not on. So you're free to basically like click out if you want. You can like shut it down or whatever. You're also welcome to stay and listen if you want. I'm just making sure you know that. Um, so yeah, so that's that's one thing I wanted to tell you all about. Another thing I wanted to tell you all about was that uh, I'm doing this free course, <laughs> which I literally came up with. The, I came up with the idea for this yesterday in my kind of crazy chaos. My tweet from yesterday was the most nuclear thing I've ever made. And it's kind of interesting to think about that, but that's a separate topic, like why why this one was so nuclear, so much more than the others. But pretty much um, in the kind of insanity of it, it got me really thinking, like people don't understand how this really works. It's not as bad as people think. Like when you write a kind of nuclear observation, it's not actually bad, but people start jumping down your throat like crazy as if you're, you know, a serial killer or something like that. It's actually a really, really profound and interesting process that it's not that hard to, to deal with. I mean, it's pretty easy to write it off. It's, it's literally like stupid people saying insanely stupid stuff. And if there's a, there's a certain way that you can see it, and then there's a certain way that there are certain practices that you can adopt that make you essentially immune to it, not only immune, but anti-fragile to this type of thing. There are ways to set up your attitude and your mentality, but also your kind of production systems, your platforms or whatever you want to call them. There's a way to set things up that when this type of insane mob behavior descends on you, 
you actually, it can be good for you. There are many things to do, many ways to do that. And I've done them all over the past year, like iteratively. It's only, it's only when the stuff occurs, when it kicks off that I realize that nobody else really knows how to do these things. So for instance, let me give you some, let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. Yesterday, pretty much when my tweet kicked off, even though the overwhelming majority of every bit of attention I was getting was negative, extremely negative. People telling me, oh, you're a disgusting pedophile. You should be killed. You know, you should have your balls chopped off. You just endless streams of people telling me this stuff. Nonetheless, yesterday, my book sales for base to lose skyrocketed. I had like a huge, I had a really good day where the past few days were, you know, the sales were starting to slow down. And I was expecting them to basically kind of slow down significantly because that's always what happens after a book launch. But yesterday, the book sales were through the roof, essentially out of the blue. It's obvious that it's because this scandal or this controversy sent a lot of attention to me. And what you don't realize is that in that massive herd of haters that are saying really nasty things to you, there are people who are seeing your you know, controversial canceled tweet and they're thinking, oh, that guy's interesting. This guy must be like a real thinker. He must be like actually courageous because he's saying these very unpopular, uh, confusing, difficult tweets and he's paying the price of a uh, pretty severe social hatred. So there are people who see that and they take it as a signal of, oh, this guy's interesting. This guy's worth listening to. And this is a really, really important thing it, it, because it happens every time in this type of scenario, but you don't see the results of it because the people who like you, who are seeing you and thinking you're cool because of it, those people are much less likely to tweet at you, to send you a DM, to email you, or to write on your Facebook wall or whatever. That's just the nature of, of psychology. The haters are way more likely to express it. And so what's really been interesting and useful about everything I've been doing over the past year is that I have figured out how to create systems where whenever this shit kicks off, all of the negative attention and the, the negative signals that are being sent to me get minimized and kind of put out of my focus. And now what I've done is I've created markers or, or signals that allow me to see and hear and feel the positive support more readily. And so for instance, like my discord server, for instance, like this is not just a little thing that I've made to kind of, uh, give a place to hang out for the people who are interested in my work. That's obviously part of the, part of the idea behind it, but it's actually a much more important thing to kind of create and sustain and facilitate a community around you and to invest in some type of community, whether you're creating it yourself or whether you're just a member of someone else's community, that's a kind of underground community of, of just honest, smart people. It's so crucial because for this reason that I'm, that I'm talking about, like when all of a sudden everyone's sending me all this hatred on the internet, well, I have a place now where I can log in and I can see people who are based and, and, and maybe they don't always agree with me. I'm not looking for like absolute constant agreement or flattery or anything like that, but they're just open-minded and they're balanced and based. And a lot of them are quite smart. So I can go there and I can see, oh, some people think what I'm saying is really cool. Some people think it's funny. Some people, you know, might disagree, but they're not like foaming at the mouth about it. And so that's a, re that's a much more powerful and significant kind of uh, tool or resource to have in this sort of thing. And when you have that, it's a game changer for, how this cancellation dynamic uh, affects you. And so that's just one example though. Another example would be um, like having an email list. People, A lot of people think like having an email newsletter, it, it's like some kind of stupid, silly, corny, like marketing thing. And to some degree, obviously it is, it's like kind of popularized by internet marketing types, but it's actually an amazing and crucial resource, I think for truly radical independent intellectuals who have a good expectation of getting into trouble here and there because essentially what an email list is, is it's just people who want to hear from you. They have an opportunity to say, Justin, I would like to hear from you. And there's no mediation. There's no institutional mediation at all. No kind of social or political pressures can, can take that away from you or, or the person who wants to hear from you. That's extremely powerful. It's extremely kind of uh, em empowering. And one of the reasons why it's empowering is because when you have an email list, it's just another signal or indicator of how many people are actually interested in you positively. And again, yesterday when this controversy kicked off and I have millions, no, thousands of people probably, of course not millions, uh, sending me like insane hate mail all day <laughs> on Twitter and elsewhere. At the same time, the number of people who are signing up to hear from me is increasing. And what's crucial is you can watch it increasing. You get, you can get an email notification or you can, you can log into your dashboard for your, your newsletter uh, platform or, or whatever. And you can see how many people are interested in what you're saying. 
And when that is increasing and you can watch it, it's a real serious kind of psychological benefit and, and power power technique. It's a way of counteracting and, bal and balancing out the, the psychological uh, innervation that occurs through through the cancellation. So these are all just different tips and tricks I've picked up over the past year, um, learning how to basically make myself cancel proof. And I I really think that I've essentially I've essentially done it because yesterday, I mean, it affects me almost not at all. And I get to watch all of these different indicators of my kind of success increasing also. So it's not at all that I'm like, have some kind of cynical, uh, you know, profiteering angle on this. It's not like I'm, I'm primarily thinking about uh, how can I build my, my, my email list and, and, and my profit? No, it's, I mean, anyone who knows me knows I've never been motivated by money. I, I, I literally just, I, it doesn't make me do anything because I just can't get myself to care enough about it. So I'm actually forcing myself to go against my nature in all honesty, because what I need is just a basic system in which the negative, you know, punishments of cancellation get outweighed by something that is psychologically effective in, in counteracting it, some kind of measure or indicator of positive reward that can just balance it out psychologically because you need that to sustain it. So, and obviously I'm also, I need to make money somehow and I need to kind of build up um, a more kind of stable and growing financial prospect of, through some way or another. But so obviously that's part of the motivation. I'm not denying that, but I'm really emphasizing the the kind of socio-psychological uh, effectiveness of these various tools, which are, which are free and easy for anyone to kind of set up and get and kind of create for themselves. And I think when you have this kind of uh, conscious, proactive attitude to like, bracing to be canceled. You know, we should think of this as war. Like if you're a serious intellectual, you have to think about the contemporary culture as, as a kind of war zone. And you are a warrior in some sense, you have to be smart, you have to be prudent and you have to not, I'm not, when I say prudent, I don't mean like, you know, uh, be a cuck or be like a coward. That's not what prudence means. Cause as we talked about in this live stream today, in the long run, that is possibly one of the most risky things you can do, but you need to be smart and you need to create the, kind of the, the psychological and financial and sociological apparatus around yourself that allows you to get canceled and get through it, not only get through it, but to actually grow from it. This is uh, Nassim Taleb's concept of anti-fragility. You don't want to just be robust against threats. You want to create systems in which every time someone does something bad to you, you actually grow and you're actually happy with it. You get, you get more of a gain from that type of cancellation than you do a loss. And Frankly, I'm I'm like really freaking proud of how much I've hacked this and how much I've kind of like figured this out over the past, uh, you know, year or so because I've been tinkering with this kind of worldview and, and creating the systems to match it for, for quite some time now. So yeah, yesterday when I kind of realized how little people understand about this way of thinking about it, I I just threw up a quick uh, free online course thing. Uh, so if you I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send out if you sign up for it I'm gonna send out just a series of short emails over like a, a short period of time where I basically just um, kind of summarize the bullet points of this overarching kind of worldview and philosophy and kind of strategic approach that I'm kind of developing. Cause it seems like a lot of people don't understand this way to think at all. And I think a lot of people would really benefit from it. So it's totally free. Um, and there's a link in the description below. So if you want to hear kind of uh, more of my thoughts on that and you want to hear kind of specific actionable suggestions and insights for how I've been thinking about that. Like everything I've kind of crystallized over my many experiences of getting shit on the internet and, and being canceled, then there's, there's a link below sign up for that. It's totally free. And, and I just want to kind of share that with people.